Thanks, Danny. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lucy. Uh, I'm up here probably because I've spent a bit of my career in UX, and now I'm in product management. And I think the way I'd describe my skill level on both of those is kind of like equally bad at both. Um, but one of the points of tension that I find often between UX and product is actually in trade-offs. Like when we can't have everything we want, which is kind of all the bloody time. Um, and this is a core part of product, is like how do you make compromises? Um, and it's always kind of like a bit of a deal with the devil. Um, bit of a content warning, you may have worked out. There are slightly satanic themes in this talk. Um, if you are not comfortable with that, sorry. Um, the other caveat on this talk is there's not some grand framework or strategy here. This is just some little tips and tricks. But you can hopefully take these to work and kind of go, oh, maybe I can try this. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Anyway, have some tips. That's what we're talking about. What is a trade-off? Let's talk about it. Um, trade-offs are where you have a thing. You have thing A and you have thing B. And as you have more of thing A, you have less of thing B. Think of this as maybe speed and quality, or maybe acquisition and retention. Um, and so you get a choice. If you want to have a lot of, say, speed, you might get not so much quality. Or if you want a lot of quality, you might not have so much speed. Or you can have a middle bit where you get a bit of speed and a bit of quality. This is one of those things that, you know, we've probably all had those kind of discussions about whether the quality level is high enough and there's pressure to go faster. And so this is a pretty common thing. And it's also often a common point of tension between product and UX because product wants speed and UX usually want quality. Um, but, every, but people aren't usually going to like confess to that. Now, not so bad if it's a linear equation, you can trade off one against the other, fine. Sometimes things get a little murky and you have different curves and they're not actually particularly easy to relate to each other. So we can kind of map stuff out a little bit. We're still talking about thing A and thing B. If you get a lot of both of them, yay, happy days. You're in the easy zone. That's what we're always aiming for. Probably not a hard decision. Probably don't have to think about it too much. Then if you get a lot of one but not a lot of the other, okay, you're in, you know, you, you, you kind of probably got good reasons for making that. Um, then if you get, you know, it starts to get harder as you make more of a compromise on each of them. And then there's the suck zone. You ever been in this place where you're like, do you know what, I'm just... I'm not getting anything of anything here, and it's just hard. That is something to be really mindful of. Um, and just to kind of check in with yourself. Are you compromising on too much stuff and not getting much of anything? Because I don't know about you guys, but I've done this. Um, now, I don't know how many people have seen this before. It's pretty common in the product world. I presume it's kind of common in UX circles as well. This is Martin Erickson's simplification of what product management was and like middle of Venn diagram, sort of basically like managing the trade-offs between these three things. But as anyone knows, when you get into the practicalities of it, it's a little bit trickier than that and it's a bit of an oversimplification and Martin would agree with this. So let's strike that out and start again. We can start off with things like quality, tech debt, time to market, growth, resources, any number of things you could add to this list. And then there are all the relationships between them and those various different trade-offs. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? You've summoned your first product manager. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did spend an entire Saturday afternoon preparing that joke for you. I'm so glad you got it. Um, this is the pentagram of product management. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't take that seriously. That's just a joke. Right, so 
got the idea of trade-offs now. Let's, I'm really waving my hands around a lot and I'm swaying back and forth, sorry. If you see me swaying back and forth, it's because I've got a three-month-old daughter and I do a lot of this at the moment and it's just become sort of learnt behaviour. Um, right, let's talk about tips. First tip, disambiguate. If you're going to sign a deal with the devil, you want to know what's in that contract. Um, this is one of the things that we often don't do enough of, which is actually be really specific about the outcome and the cost of that outcome. So I use this little formula just to formulate simple sentences, and sometimes I write them down, sometimes I just say, to pe say them to people, of is this what we're doing, just as a sort of check-in. Um, so something like this. To be first to market, we will only build essential features to the minimum acceptable quality level. I don't want to open the door on the MVP debate, but some people would define this as an MVP, but we're not going there because we like each other. <laughs> um, to be recognized as a full platform, we will launch with a, a broad but shallow feature set. That's indicating, it's telling you what the cost is, so it's actually being explicit about that, because a lot of the time we hide the cost. We don't kind of want to talk about it. We bitch about it at the pub afterwards, but we don't always actually um, be really clear with leadership about what the cost is. Um, you can see other ones. You, could, you can just frame this. So to differentiate in a crowded market, we will take a longer time to get to market. In order to build high quality, innovative and fully featured product based on extensive research and insights. That's probably, that sounds kind of like what Figma did, if you ask me. That was kind of their approach. And they knew they were going to take longer to get to market, but they knew it was a competitive space and they had to be good. Um, it starts to look a little bit like a high-level strategy at this stage. You do it often enough for a lot of things and you bubble up those themes and you can almost reverse engineer yourself into a strategy if you try hard enough. This is one I have experience of, or first-hand experience of, which is to maximize selection, we offer both pay-as-you-go and subscription models, which will have a more complicated experience than subscription-only models. That's Amazon Video compared to Netflix. We knew straight up front, we, we wanted broad selection. We wanted to offer the maximum selection. The only way we could do that was with a more complicated experience. And that was a trade-off that that business was prepared to make at the time. So that's tip one. That's about just being clear about what's going on and disambiguating. Second tip, eliminate. Um, Devils, and kind of like, that's a siren, by the way, just in case it wasn't immediately obvious. They're in the demonic category, so they're kind of coming into this talk. Um, we always get tempted by these really attractive things that appeal to us and take us in the wrong direction. Um, if you're a fan of Greek mythology, Odysseus um, was due to sail past the sirens, and so he got his crew to plug wax into their ears, and he got them to strap him to the mast so he could hear them, but not actually be distracted by them. Um, it's just a way of eliminating options. And I would recommend you do the same. There's actually not just Greek mythology to guide us on this, but some um, recent sort of theories coming out of neuroscience about how the brain works and you know, little electrified, juicy meat in our heads that makes these decisions for us. And it's, the, the theory is that it gives you a certain amount of electrical signal for each decision. And it gives each option there a little bit of that, um, of that signal. And so the more options you have, the difference between the weakest option and the greatest option is actually a lot less. So it's really difficult. So you, what they've found, and you know, because we base so much of our stuff on how people buy candy bars, it is the sort of thing where as you get offered a wide range of candy bars, people make worse decisions. I don't know why so much of our psychology that we use is based on people buying candy bars, um, but these are all factors that we kind of include. So, you know, ideally eliminate options and you'll get a stronger signal between a smaller group of decisions. So what does this look like for me? 
This was an exercise I did recently with our leadership team where we had kind of identifying things that we could work on. Um, and instead of kind of stack ranking them all, we did a vote off the island exercise. It's more fun that way. You can kind of go, okay, look, there's no point in us talking about 20 or 30 things. So we can only work on a couple of things at once. Let's just focus in and work on that. And so we got people to essentially vote stuff off. You don't really need to be that accurate at that level. Kind of groupthink actually works then. And then you can get into the specific stuff of what is remaining. Interesting side effect of this was that there were actually, everyone thought at least everything should be voted off the island at least, one, at least twice. <laughs> Did a really good job of framing actually how tough that conversation was going to be. Third tip, validate. Bet you didn't expect to see a vicar there, did you? Um, this, this is not necessarily validation with customers, but more validation with your internal stakeholders. When you're making trade-offs, um, it's often there are people in the business who have made those kind of decisions before. Check in with them. My experience of this was um, doing a really complicated uh, platform migration at Amazon. We were moving, um, we were changing the whole application, or changing the um, technology base for the whole application. So we're essentially rebuilding stuff. There's a lot of work and we were like, oh, obviously it took way longer than we thought it was going to. We're running out of time. There was one feature particularly that if we deprecated that feature instead of carrying it across, um, it would save us, we would actually kind of get there in time. And there were certain benefits to going to the new platform, like loading time was much, much quicker. And I spoke to my peers about this and the general feedback was TIA. If you haven't worked at Amazon before, TIA is shorthand for this is Amazon. Yes, they are that arrogant. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it's basically TIA. We don't deprecate features. We don't breach customer trust that way. And that was the, that was the steer I got from my peers. I was kind of like, I can't, I can't do this. We, we just, we can't take this long. I kind of know what's coming up in the roadmap. And there's a bunch of stuff we just have to get to, or we're dead in the water if we take this long on it. Um, and so I was in that sort of position of like, everyone's telling me not to but I'm gonna to go to leadership with this. And I took it to leadership and they were just like, yep, easy decision, let's do it. They had the view of it. They had also been people who had deprecated features before and were comfortable with that idea and knew that there was a way of doing it. Um, whereas my peers who hadn't actually had this little encounter with the devil before were all kind of like, no, we can't possibly do that. So there's just something there about, you know, making sure you're checking in with the right people. Next tip, illustrate. If you don't know, that's Lucifer's sigil. I didn't know he had one. Um, but again, interesting things you learned preparing for talks. Um, this, <laughs> this should appeal to, you know, a, as a UX community, it's like, use your visual skills. They are so useful at improving communication. If we're going to talk to a devil, we usually have to have runes and we have to have kind of symbols and things to strengthen that communication. It works equally well in a corporate setting. Infer from that what you will. Um, let me give you an example. So if you haven't counted it before, really quick, simple thing of agreed target quality framework. Um, I encountered it from Shreyas Doshi, who was referring to Jeff Seibert, but I haven't actually managed to track down the original, so, because I'm a bit lazy. Um, so it's just this sort of thing of like, let's have a conversation right up front about the quality we're going for here. You know, most people kind of, the, the, there's an implicit kind of, I guess, expectation that we're going for elegant or exquisite, but actually that's not always the case. And then there's, like real frustration when we get down to the flawed and broken unless we've actually agreed that. But it's just a useful conversation to have. But you can make it slightly more powerful just by kind of giving it an extra dimension. And suddenly we've got our thing A and thing B and we can say, where should we be on this? If we go for this much of thing A, you know, we know that if we want an exquisite experience, that's going to take really deep research and lots of iteration and discovery and do we want 
it's going to take us longer because we've just, we've just got to do more work. It just doesn't happen by accident. Or are we okay with something sort of slightly broken and a bit shitty because we're just testing this idea or whatever? Have those conversations. If your product people aren't prompting those conversations, instigate it yourself. Have a chat with the engineers. See, where do you think we are? I usually like to use these as just ways to validate and kind of go, like, if we're looking at this, where do you think we're aiming for? And just elicit understanding from people, because it's actually a lot easier for people to indicate on a piece of paper where they think they are than actually verbalize a lot of that stuff. Right. <laughs> Liberate, genies, yay. Um, sometimes you do get what you ask for. It's always worth asking. It's really easy to get into a compromise mindset. Um, I have done this where I have just got, so beaten, well, not beaten down, yeah, beaten down. You know, you're just like, you're grinding away. Everything's hard, everything's a compromise. And sometimes you forget to step back and go, if we actually really wanted to achieve A, what would it take? What would be required to do that? And can you reframe the problem? Maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's like, actually, A isn't quite the right thing. What we should be doing is B, and let's go for it. So. Do take that time to say, if I could have three wishes, what would it be? There is one caveat to this, because what most people answer with is, I need more resource. <laughs> Does everyone know where this is going? Yeah. Nine women can't have a baby in a month. Um, the other one is, you know, twice the size of orchestra can't play a symphony twice as fast. I mean, well, they possibly could, but it wouldn't be great. Um, but everyone usually asks for more resource, and everyone in the business is usually asking for more resource at the same time. Be very, very careful about asking for that. See what you can do with the resource that you have available, or see if you can shift it, or do something else. But it's kind of, it's the lazy thing to go, we just need more people, we just need more people. So actually, it often, when you get more people, things start to go slower. There are more people to keep engaged. There are more people. Your collaboration quality gets worse because you've got dragging more people into this and you've got more conversations that you need to moderate. So just be slightly careful on the asking for uh, more resources thing. I don't know why I just wanted to draw nine pregnant women. Um, <laughs> it's right. Um, everyone know the story of Sisyphus? Kind of tricked Hades a couple of times and as a result got um, punished by having to roll a really large rock up a hill again and again and again every day. Um, basically, no good deed goes unpunished. If you get good... <laughs> At making trade-offs, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be doing more of them. Um, and so if we're going to spend a lot of our time focusing on trade-offs and how to do these, do we want to think about our process? Do we want to be intentional about that so that we can iterate on it? And this is what I do, or have started to do recently, which is like, with a bit of hindsight, hindsight's a wonderful thing, we all have it, um, but let's be more structured about it and just go, would I make the same decision again or would I make a different decision? Would I use the same process? Would I use a different process? You start to get into the kind of quadrants. Oh, same decision, same process. Yay, do more of that. We like that. Same decision, different process. This is possibly about efficiency and optics. Um, you know, did you talk to the right people at the right time? Did you get the right data at the right time? How could you have made that process faster and brought more people along on the journey? Maybe you pissed someone off while you did this. And hands up, everyone's done that. Well, okay, I've done enough for everyone in this room. Um, so, you know, we'll keep that one quiet. Um, there's then, if you have, if you kind of like the process, but you'd come to a different decision. That's an interesting one to reflect on and explore. Um, why, what was it about the process that worked? What can you take forward? But how would you get to a different decision? And, um, and the final quadrant, which is the one where you kind of, 
you know, first temptation is to sort of hide your head in shame a little bit at this point. V is the different process and a different decision. And don't hide your head in shame in this area. It's, this is one of the hardest things to do, but it's actually where you get real levelling up in your career. This is where you kind of go, OK, I did the wrong thing and I ended up in the wrong space. And if I can understand the root cause of why I did that, then I can really make a difference in how I think. And so whilst this is often, you know, we find this slightly uncomfortable, kind of going, oh, yeah, I really kind of got that wrong on multiple levels. Um, it is where you really do want to spend a, t a bit of time, even if it kind of makes you cringe internally, which it does to me. Um, I've also been informed that my handwriting isn't that legible, so I did a prettier version. Oh, this is the Miro board that I use. Um, I also use post-it notes, um, color code them, so, because often I think I've made a good decision at the time that I make that decision, because if I thought it was a bad decision, I wouldn't make it. Um, and then a bit of time passes, and hindsight grows, and sometimes those decisions move. So I just like to kind of go, do I know this was a good decision now? Do I have enough information? Have I seen what's happened? And it just reminds me to kind of come back and check stuff. And so it ends up looking something like this. Um, what is interesting is, as I've done this, I've actually found there was one particular decision that I was reflecting on last week, and it started off in the top left corner, moved to the top right corner, then moved down into the bottom left, and now I suspect is actually probably in the bottom right as I've gone through it and gone, actually, actually, I really should have. And it's helped me kind of be able to go, you thought that was a good decision, but actually you didn't look at the other options enough. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, that's how I'm using that as a sort of personal learning log, um, which you know, you're more than welcome to do if you like, want to get better at trade-offs and decision makings and stuff. Okay. Um, I say okay a lot, sorry about that, people. Right, let's talk about stipulate. This is when you're making a decision or a trade-off and it's quite easy to get caught up in what you're compromising on and kind of lose sight of the biggest picture. And it was quite funny watching Alison's talk because I think this next slide is going to show you a lot about the difference between UX and product. Um, well, or at least this next little bit of slides. So what I like to do is kind of go, what are the top three or five things that we care about? List them out. What are the things in our product that we, you know, we care about? Where are that we compared to other people in the industry? We put a little, you are here, so I'm simple. We then kind of go, where do we want to be? Well, we probably, you know, this is our target. You might be seeing a very similar format to what Alison was talking about, except this has none of the level of detail that Alison has, um, <laughs> which is possibly the difference between product and UX. We're just very slapdash. Um, and so this is the step that we want to take as part of this. And so having that, I find this is quite a simple way to communicate stuff to um, to stakeholders and go, and, and to teams to go, like, this is what we're trying to accomplish by this. Everyone then kind of goes, oh, okay, all right, if that's what we're trying to accomplish, maybe, maybe we're not, maybe this isn't the right compromise to make. It sort of just contextualizes what that is. And you do that in enough things, and suddenly you've got something that looks kind of like, again, this bottom-up strategy sort of thing if you haven't had the time to do the big work. Um, So that's my little way of doing that. Now, no talk about devils would be complete without a little bit of Latin in there. Uh, and I believe this is pronounced humanitate. Um, I'm Australian, my Latin pronunciation is gonna be horrible. Um, so I'll just say humanitate. Um, <laughs> Remember that when you're making these kind of decisions, it's humans at the end of it. Everyone's going to be, dis or 
whatever decision you make, there are going to be people who are disappointed by that. Be compassionate about that and do what you can to mitigate the consequences of that because you may well be making someone's job harder. Um, it's often something that I see where you get teams fight it, or functions fighting with each other because they care so much about something, but everyone is trying to pull, trying to achieve the same thing. It's just often, as you've heard so many times today, it's communication. It's that we're not quite in the same place. We're not being explicit about what it is. And so this is, you know, this is just my bit to say, remember we're all people. We're getting paid to work. It's frustrating. We would much rather be out there climbing mountains and doing various other things. So be kind to each other. Um, and if you didn't realize why, there were some really stupid words in there. There you go. Um, that, is, that is the devilish framework to trade off. Thank you very much, it's been fun.